Welcome to this uh, scripture and ministry interview uh, with Dr. Esther Meek of Geneva College. My name is Owen Strand, and I'm joined by Pastor Steve Farish, and we have the privilege of interviewing Dr. Meek, who yesterday in our scripture and ministry lecture series gave a talk on epistemology, on knowing, knowing, and uh, knowing God, and we are very excited to have her here this morning. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yes, and uh, we'll, we'll start with Pastor Steve's first question. Dr. Meek, um, these interviews are designed both for pastors and scholars. Mm -hmm. And being a pastor myself, I'm well aware there may be viewers who are less familiar with your ideas, less familiar with the field of epistemology mm -hmm. than others. Mm -hmm. Consequently, uh, would you kindly summarize the basic idea of covenant epistemology, which you hold, and in the process summarize mm -hmm. for the viewer somewhat your book, Learning, uh, Longing to Know, as well. Yes, in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, let me say about philosophy and <clears throat> epistemology in particular, epistemology is the, the philosophical question about how we know whatever we know. So, and that's the thing that very, very much interests me. But I always feel about uh, the BHQs, as I call them, the big hairy questions, <laughs> um, uh, which are how do I know what is real, what is right and good, and what is it to be human, um, that every person, whether they've, they know what philosophy is or not, presumes answers to those questions just as part of living. And that's why I think philosophy should be accessible and a resource for everybody, everybody. And um, so that's part of my calling in philosophy, because obviously not every philosopher thinks that way. <laughs> and we live in a society that has um, totally neglected teaching philosophy to students. Um, we've been way more pragmatic and, and that sort of a thing. So, to see that it's a, a, an incredibly important discipline is just something that uh, needs to be argued for these days when it shouldn't, it shouldn't be. Um, then uh, I'm also unique in that I uh, am interested in the work of Michael Polanyi, who was a scientist who developed epistemolo an ep a fresh epistemology that fits no school, philosophical school, and so he's not widely known or even accepted in the philosophical tradition. But for me as an ordinary person, I found in his approach to knowing something that very easily was unleashable to ordinary people. So uh, with Polanyi's approach to knowing, which I use in longing to know, I can talk about ordinary things like riding a bike and we can be talking about how we know. And so those kinds of things really, really interest me. Just the ordinary kn knowings of life, which we always already do. Um, but it's just that because in our Western tradition, we kind of inherit these preconceived notions, we can actually be kept from seeing what it is we actually do do when we're knowing well. And um, so we tend to think, and this is where I started yesterday in my talk, we, we have what I call a default setting with regard to what knowing is or what knowledge is. We tend to think that knowledge is information, that it's facts, that it's statements and, there, and other statements that support them, so statements and proofs. We tend to think that that is knowledge. We tend to think if you can't put it into words, then you don't know it. Um, so the point that I tried to make uh, at the beginning of the talk to get it going is that maybe we ought to rethink what we take knowledge to be. Another thing that we tend to do is distinguish knowledge from other things. And so uh, we, we distinguish it, we set it over against belief or opinion. We align fact with knowledge and set that over against value. So we've got these like dichotomies, these pairs uh, that oppose each other that we've inherited just by growing up in the West. Fact, value, faith, reason, faith, mind, body, um, theory, application. And, and, and that's in our default setting. And I want to argue that that's sick. It's kind of like we've, we've got this default setting that's diseased, but we bring it to all of 
what we think we're doing when we're knowing, and it actually blinds us to what we are actually doing and what we are actually doing well, which involves way more than what you're able to put into actual words. And how do you teach a four-year-old to ride a bicycle? You know, I mean, you can use the word balance. You need to use the word balance. But if, if the kid doesn't know what balance means, if, if knowledge is limited to that sentence, how do they ever come to know? How do, you, how do you ever come to know anything at all? So there must be something else going on. There must be something more going on. And that's what I'm always intrigued to explore. Uh, so that sets up the problem. And then what I see myself doing is, is helping people identify this default setting that's defective and see why it's defective and then propose an alternative. And what I would like to propose is a different picture of what knowing is like. Um, to uh, uh, develop a, dif a different default setting. And actually, I didn't say this in my talk, but I want to argue that there is a more basic default setting. It's called being human. Oh, and being made by God. <laughs> so so uh, getting rid of the default that's actually blinding us to the deeper default about how we always do go about knowing. So uh, my proposal then is that we take as our paradigm of all acts of knowing, the interpersonal covenantal relationship. And in particular, I have in mind the relationship between a person and God as kind of the central paradigmatic um, model for all knowing. And um, what that does is, is kind of put our love of Jesus front and center in all of our knowings as kind of a picture of what it ought to look like. And so what it's leading me to explore is how it is that my relationship with, as a knower, my, my action as a knower, my efforts to know, are kind of like an interpersonal relationship that I'm developing with the yet to be known. So knowing is a relationship between knower and known. And that leads me to talk about the known as person-like and, and responding well to be treated, to being treated in a person-respectful way. And that's really what covenant epistemology is all about. I'm trying to explore those kinds of things. So, uh, you know, how do we live? Uh, and I close the lecture with this. I have a little phrase, invite the real. Um, if, if you want to, if you long to know how to fly a fighter jet, <laughs> you know, you do your time. You have to learn all the instruments. You have to go to the school. You have to pass the test. I mean, you, you invest a whole lot in putting yourself in a position to be able to access the real in, in that respect. And so what you're doing is behaving, uh, starting to behave on the terms of the as yet undiscovered reality. And that's a very honoring thing to do. Reality graciously self-discloses to people who put themselves in the, in the, the place to see it, that, that um, invest that time. So I think that's a good model for um, how we go about all of our knowing. One thing I didn't mention, there's a um, a Nobel Prize winning biologist named, her name is slipping my mind at the moment, but she, she has uh, been very uh, public about the fact that she goes about knowing in biology like this, and that it's more effective as a scientific approach to see it as more of a sympathetic uh, connecting with persons than, you know, the, the kind of the typical, uh, you've got to be distanced and aloof from what you're knowing so that you can be objective, which Michael Polanyi, the scientist and, and discoverer, said, you know, you know, that's, that's false. That's false. <laughs> so I'm just developing those dimensions. In your book, Longing to Know, probably the <clears throat> most well-known image is that of the concept that knowing God is something like knowing your auto mechanic. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could unpack that image a bit 
yeah. for our viewers. Yeah, that okay. would be helpful to them to understand your basic premise, I think. Right. Mm -hmm. What I try to show, that book, Longing to Know, is a book written for people considering Christianity who have questions about knowing. And uh, that certainly was my own story. I, know, I knew what I was supposed to believe about God. My question wasn't about God, it was about how we know. And so some, of, some people, more than others, I think, especially when considering Christianity, either as being uh, yet to be Christians or being Christians in crisis, raise questions about, well, how do I know? And especially if you're going to be a Christian, there's some claims you need to affirm, if you just take for argument the Apostles' Creed, you need to be saying those are true. So what does that, you know, how, how you've got to explore questions about knowing. And my approach in justifying my Christianity to myself has always been to, that I needed to show to myself that, that the knowing that's involved in being a Christian is just like the knowing that's involved in all acts of knowing. Now, obviously, to know God is transformative in a way, in a way that knowing my auto mechanic shouldn't be. Um, <laughs> unless he's in the void, but, but in any case. Uh, uh, unless he's an especially terrific auto mechanic. <laughs> yeah, I, I did have a good one in St. Louis. But, um, uh, okay, well, let's see, I lost my track. Oh, but the same things go on in knowing God as go on in knowing my auto mechanic. For example, you know, I, you look at Christians and they do this weird thing uh, what, that's like believing a book to tell them about some, th some reality they don't see. I mean, that's so odd, now, you know, that, that Christians have a Bible. So what, what role does a Bible or a book pl play? And is, is there a kind of a, a counterpart in all knowing to what, how the Bible functions in, in knowing God. Well, I think there is. And, and so I developed this idea, which I really get from John Frame, of, of the role of authoritative guides in all of knowing. Consider just by example uh, how uh, athletes have to have a coach. You know, and, and that's just, a, or if you're gonna take piano lessons, it's just assumed you've got a piano teacher. And, you know, I did to have a fighter pilot, a retired jet fighter pilot as a student. And when I talked to him about longing to know an authoritative guys, he said, tell them. <laughs> it was like he was dying. Tell them. <laughs> You're absolutely right. There is no way you could fly a fighter pilot, a pilot, fighter jet, unless you had an authoritative guide. So that, well, that's what the Bible does. I mean, right? It's, it's trusting the words of an authority. But we do that all the time. All, all over our lives. So, so it, it helped me in justifying my Christianity to myself to see that it's an ordinary act of knowing. So, knowing God is like knowing your auto mechanic. It's like, and that was just the, the example that I took. I mean, there's lots of other examples through the book. Covenant epistemology, which I pray will come to birth soon, the, this next book, it's kind of like I'm saying knowing your auto mechanic is like knowing God. So I want to say, oh, you know what? The paradigm, a very helpful paradigm of all acts of knowing is knowing God. So do you see how that's kind of the converse? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, this seems to have some resonance with Planinga's basic belief, um, his, his conversation about warrant and his um, insights there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's this idea of a kind of a basic relationship that informs uh, either belief in his case or knowledge in your case. Um, it's, it has some resonances in it, and it pushes against, it sounds like, uh, a, an understanding of faith or a relationship with God, however you want to put it, as this kind of incomprehensible, um, otherworldly experience that one can only grasp if one takes a, a leap off of a Right. An intellectual cliff or something like yeah. that. You're saying it sounds like to me like you're doing something very helpful and saying this is a pretty basic thing. Mm -hmm. This this act of knowing and knowing God. Mm -hmm. um, I one th thing that I as you talk I see that both Planica and I are doing, and it's important to do, and and it's kind of l related to this default mm. is when we think of what it is to be rational. 
we, we actually often don't even raise the question. We just say, okay, so this is rational and this isn't. Hmm. But both my work and Planiga's says, oh, well, maybe we need to revise what we think rationality is. Right. And uh, uh, Polanyi, as a scientific discoverer, was doing that. And I've, I've picked mm. up on that. And, and that's what Planiga does, too. So right. Planiga is all about, so why should we think that belief in God is irrational? You know? And so right. picking up on the sensus divinitatis, you know, the idea that there's this right. innate mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> awareness of God and that's entirely rational. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you don't come home to your spouse and say, well, how do I know you exist? Mm -hmm. How do I know you have a mind? <laughs> right? That would be very offensive. <laughs> you know, so, so there, there, he, you know, he's making the point that there's uh, these beliefs that even apart from proof, it is rational to hold. So it's, it's, a, it's a different approach from mind, but yeah. similar in that you know, it's raising questions about, so what, so what do we think rational is? And it's very helpful to see, and this, we, we do this in philosophy all the time, uh, to see that what rationality is, what science is, what any sort of discipline is, is a philosophical question. Right. And, and needs to be attended to, yeah, which is some, a pitch for doing philosophy. There's some bluff calling going on here that's very helpful, I think, by both. Planning or like uh, shifting the burden of proof, is yeah, that what you mean exactly. by bluff call, yeah. calling? Mm -hmm. Maybe you're assuming too much here. You yeah, know, that's right. To the yeah. hardcore rationalists. That's right. There's some people, uh, I mean, when you, when you just, one of the things that's going on uh, in this whole preconceived approach to rationality and knowledge is it's been common to argue that there's, uh, that secularism is possible, that that there's, there is kind of this uh, possibility of n information that's neutral, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so, yeah. but the only way that you can come up to kind of the secular tables to check any sort of private and religious be beliefs at the door, well, uh, obviously Christians have a reason to contest that, but scholars have a reason to contest that because it's bad scholarship. <laughs> So there, there, there's actually people who are, who used to think of themselves as seculars, who, who have realized, well, there's a, that that's shaped by fundamental belief commitments, and so nobody comes to some sort of neutral, uncontestable area. Everybody comes working from fundamental belief commitments, and if you deny that, that's bad scholarship. And one of the things that uh, yeah. has been really good that the postmoderns, but also lots of philosophers over the last uh, couple of centuries have sounded the, the um, well, you use the word called the bluff yeah. uh, uh, of philosophies, is, is to challenge this idea that uh, philosophy and science can be done or is done apart from shaping belief commitments. And uh, one of the more graphic pictures that gets used is the, the child that says, well, the emperor has no clothes on. You know, it's like this, so that, again, back to your calling bluff language, you know, er, nobody comes to any sort of neutral table of knowledge somehow without belief commitments that are, that are interpreted, they're storied, they're, they're rooted in, in mm -hmm. our upbringing, and, and that's what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a very helpful thing to realize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a question I have as I uh, listen to what you say is, how much does the biblical idea of knowing God, even down to the meaning of the verbs mm -hmm. in Hebrew and Greek, how much does the biblical idea of knowing God as being, as including fundamentally relationship, how much does that yeah. inform your Question. basic principles mm. in epistemology? Well, I, I think it, it informs it significantly. But the trick is this, that because we all bring preconceived notions to Scripture, 
Some of what we've inherited in Western philosophy has blinded us to what Scripture is actually saying. So the gospel has been castrated, as Leslie Newbigin said, because of the, the, the philosophical naivety that's meant that we have bought into some Western concepts. So we don't even get it. We don't even know how to read the scripture and let it shape our philosophical commitments because we don't know that we have them. So um, I, I see what this does as, and this service of at least this philosophical approach as allowing scripture to have the authority it was meant to have yeah. to shape what I have now identified as actually existing and, and needing to be shaped. Does that make sense? It does. So then you see, we can take, once we start to talk about knowing relationally, then we can say, oh, you know, th think about the, the knowing that's modeled in scripture, the whole idea of the covenant relationship that stories all of scripture. Mm. You know, to see that as this mutuality of relationship or to see that when God shows up, it's not like, oh, my questions were all answered. No, it's not like that, you know? No, he changed the questions, you know? And, and, and what happens is not gleaning information, but it's like alien takeover, <laughs> you know? So, so we're more able to see what is actually there in scripture when we have raised questions and, and thought with some sensitivity about what, how we should see knowing. Does that make sense? It does, it does. <clears throat> and if I, if I may ask a favor, because I found it enormously helpful in your talk yesterday. I thought the definition you offered of covenant mm -hmm. was, was- Did you like really, that? I did like that. And I, I thought it was very faithful to scripture. Oh, that's good. Uh, can you- uh, Say it again? Can you say it okay. again for the viewers who, who weren't here yeah. yesterday, which is why they're viewing this. But I, I, I found it really faithful yeah. to, to the scriptural teaching, and I think others would too. Mm -hmm. Well, I get that from theologian Mike Williams, who's uh, probably <clears throat> the best book to read is uh, Far As the Curse is Found. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's the, like the biblical drama of redemption or something, whatever the subtitle is, and it's a PNR book. And um, I used to teach with him, and we, we still are, uh, you know, uh, intellectual partners, I, I guess I should say. We, we, we discuss a lot of things together. But um, so I, this is his approach, and he's the one, you know, I talked to him about knowing, and he said, well, that's just like the covenant, <laughs> you know. So those uh, phrases in that definition are just, I just lifted from okay. Williams. So what he says is the most important thing to see about biblical covenant is it is a relationship of mutuality it's an un, it's unfolding history, so getting at the continuity discontinuity thing, um, and it's uh, typified by promises and obligations. Both uh, both you know the initiative, the gracious initiative of God, uh, but also the self binding of God to be faithful, and then uh, response. You know the idea that grace and sovereign grace always comes first, and uh, law is is response, and. Um, uh, to the end of communion or, or friendship. So an unfolding relationship, uh, historied or unfold, unfolding in time, typified by promises and obligations, mutuality uh, to the end of, of communion. I, I'm not sure whether I've got them all. But um, what Mike does consistently is to uh, compare it to uh, family relationships. Mm -hmm. So for example, say, you know, the woman you married, <laughs> And the woman she is now, there's lots of discontinuity as well as continuity, but you've got this unfolding relationship, storied relationship. And then the other thing he'll do is talk about, you know, a parent-child relationship. And so he's, he's, he's very explicit to say there's a big difference between a contract and a covenant. And yes, you've got the suzerainty, vassal sort of thing going on, but what God is doing in scripture is not exactly that. I mean, it's partly that, but you've got this, this familial thing 
going on all the way through too. So that, that idea I get from that book, Far as the Curse is well, Found. And as I hear you talking, I'm, I'm hearing the word yada, the, mm -hmm. the Hebrew word mm -hmm. yada just that echoing through my and mind. And Gnosko too. And That's Gnosko, right. Yeah. Discovery, these, yep. These fuller understandings of knowledge That's right. beyond a simply intellectual. Why the heck would we reduce knowledge to information? You know, when you think of knowing your wife, mm. knowing your da daughter, That's right. uh, knowing your family, knowing your parishioners, uh, knowing, I, I mean, that's knowing. And yes, information's part of that. You know, blue eyes, you know, cool little hairdo, you know. You know. <laughs> but, but so what? I mean, yes, uh, that's important. In my honoring you, that matters to me, but that's not all there is to to knowing. Right. Could you talk some about how the Trinitarian relationship informs this? Because I was, I was a bit in and out uh, during your talk, just handling different things, so I may have missed it, but th it seems like there are major overtones, obviously, with the Trinity. Mm -hmm. this, this understanding yeah. of knowledge, it seems, would proceed directly from mm -hmm. a biblical understanding of of the Trinity. And the idea specifically of perichoresis, mm -hmm. that uh, mutual indwelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. Mutual indwelling is a phrase that James Loder uses, and, and that book is the transforming moment. And in Contours of Covenant Epistemology, Conversations on the Way to Knowing, each chapter is conversation with. So it, it, that becomes my structure for, you know, kind of standalone essays in engaging these different books. So then there's the chapter Knowing as Dance, and that's mm -hmm. conversation with Colin Gunton. Mm -hmm. And his, the book that I worked with is uh, right. The One, The Three, and The Many. Mm. And um, I, uh, you know, I haven't started life as a theologian. I'm a Christian, but, but my discipline's philosophy, and then I'm a Polanian. And uh, so starting with the Trinity, it depends, you know, start is a funny word. Hmm. Sometimes you're freed up to start with the Trinity, which is how I see, you know, philosophically freed up to, hmm. to now see that the, that, that the Trinity, of course, is the ultimate reality. Right. Why shouldn't the rest of reality be somehow akin, you know? Right. But then this idea of, the, of, uh, of personhood as, by definition, being to be in communion, persons in communion. Persons are only persons if they are formed in communion. Mm -hmm. uh, John Zazulis argued that if you shape your philosophical anthropology away from a substance, attribute, rational, animal sort of approach to one that says to be is to be in communion, that makes better sense of the Trinity. Mm. And then, it was the Cappadocian fathers that, that used this idea of perichoresis, the idea of dance, dancing around. So to, and what that helps do with the Trinity is help us to see that it's living and dynamic. It's not, as one church historian I know calls it, clunky. It's not <laughs> clunky. <laughs> it's not static. And you know, when I raised the question, well, what about the unchangeability of God with this church historian? He said, well, there's two, way, two things that unchangeability can mean. One is static, but the other is faithful. You know, and, and so in a way, does that not go with what Scripture says about God's steadfast love? You can't predict what he's going to do. You know, but once he's done it, you see that it's part of this dynamic faithfulness. And so, and then you see the idea that this perichoresis in dance, you've got an equal weight given to relationality and particularity. Mm -hmm. One thing mm -hmm. that I think is absolutely <clears throat> unique about Christianity is that communion is not absorption. Right. Now, if you're a monist, like, an, like Eastern religions, absorption is your goal. Hmm. So only in a Christian tradition, I say with, the word with is the most Christian word. God with us. It isn't God is us, hmm. or we are God. It never is that in, in a healthy relationship you absorb each other. Right? right? And so there's the Trinity. It's three in one. Mm -hmm. 
forever. Three in one. Mm -hmm. So you get this, this balancing of relationality and particularity, and then the dance idea means it's rhythmical, you know, that there, there's just a, you know, just this back and forth, this mutuality, mm -hmm. that's, that's very cool. So, mm -hmm. the, you know, one of the things I say to my beginning students is, you know, philosophy is about the, like the most basic question. So here's one of the most basic questions. What is reality basic, most basically? Is it one or is it many? Here's another one. What is reality most basically? Is it being or is it becoming? That, now that's what philosophy is about. Mm -hmm. And if, if you change your view of the Trinity from something on the being line to something on the dynamism line, doesn't that change how all of reality looks? You know, if, if, if you think about the ultimate reality. And by the way, again, Christianity is unique. Which is more basic, mm -hmm. one or many? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate reality balances them. So, for example, Colin Gunton's argument in the one, the three, and the many is society and our engagement of, of the non-human world, like think environmental stuff, has gone to pot because Christians haven't been Trinitarian enough. So in other words, at key points when the doctrine of the Trinity should have been argued for and its impact on uh -huh. cultural engagement, it hasn't been. So that's his thesis in that book. Hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, we should. Okay, we're gonna need to edit this part. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for these very helpful answers. And if you could just very quickly tell uh, the pastors and, and listeners again what books you've mm -hmm. written that might be of service okay. to them and how and they the could help. And the two that are forthcoming also. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm, I'm probably most known for longing to know the philosophy of knowledge for ordinary people that I talked about earlier. It's a Brazos book, came out in 2003. I have a website uh, named for the book, longingtoknow.com, that you can get on and see not particularly up to date, but there's, there's other things that I've written on there. Um, I do a lot of online posts for Common Grounds Online. And um, uh, this book that, uh, oh, and actually, Longing to Know isn't my first book. I wrote uh, with Don McNair, The Practices of the Healthy Church. Um, and uh, I've done writing with Brian Chappell at Covenant Seminary, so there's, those things are out there too. But um, and then I revised uh, Williams as far as the curse is found for publication. But um, so Contours of Covenant Epistemology is the one that I have in draft form and uh, am very anxious to get public. And then I do have a contract to revise my old dissertation for publication with Paternoster. That's the next project and that would be called Contact with Reality, Polanyi's Realism and Its Value for Christian Faith. So, did I cover That's it all? That's it. Okay. Absolutely. And, Thank you. And, and David Wells says of longing to know, it's a tour de force. <laughs> so people should know about that. And, and as you mentioned earlier, Pastor John Steve. John Frame also reviews it very favorably. So very you'd want to check that out. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks Pastor for having Steve, me. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Blessings. Thank, Thank you. you.